The first thing we did was we actually said 5.1 infections per thousand line days was actually 37 patients who got a total of 49 central line infections. That meant about one in every three got at least two. We used a lot of central lines. We had 1,753 admissions to these 26 beds. About two thirds of our patients had a central line for at least 12 hours. This was an ICU, so pretty high utilization of central lines. Actually, one out of every 22 human beings that came into the ICU I ever saw got an infection. One out of every 22 human beings that came to me for help had this happen to them. I didn't quite see that when it was 5.1 infections per thousand line days. So what do you do when you have one of these problems? So the first thing you can't do is blame, right? The absolute next thing to do is don't form a committee. <laughs> If when you see data like this, you form a committee, you are creating a barrier. Resist the temptation to meet and embrace the opportunity to act. Do something. Do something. Don't watch it. Make everybody responsible for those 19 deaths, including you, the leader. I never touched one of those patients, but I felt personally responsible that I was presiding over a unit where I was allowing this to happen. Everyone has to be responsible. And then at the start, please avoid the notion you need the perfect. This is about continuing to learn. So we developed this concept of perfecting patient care which was the application of the principles of lean to delivery of care in, the health, in a hospital. Perfecting patient care is designed to provide workers with problem solving capabilities to identify and eliminate variations that are the breeding ground for errors. And it's part of our process to transform our culture from one of blame to this concept of continuously learning, that there's never a right answer. Now, let me just say at the beginning, I'm agnostic to what tools you use. There's no, nothing special about the tools. The tools have been written about a million times. What's the true challenge is who can apply the tools in practice every day? That's what characterizes a reliable organization. So, the tools, I'm agnostic. This just happened to be the way we did it. So it was a pretty simple process. As a leader, I declared that these 26 beds would no longer accept anything but zero, that we would eliminate central line infections in that unit in 90 days from the day we declared it. Now, this is the leader declaring an unambiguous goal. I didn't say 10% in two years, I said zero. People laughed. They said he's out of his mind out of his mind. We really got him now. He set himself up for failure. But I would submit to you, if you're not bold in establishing the goal, you will not capture the energy of workers because they got a lot to do. If this is 10% over the next decade, safety must be a precondition of work. It can't be a priority. It's got to be transcend priorities. A precondition of coming to work today is no one will get hurt. After that, I can worry about curing breast cancer. But I can't cure breast cancer if 10% of the people that have it get a line infection. So what do I mean by variation in work? When we observed people placing central catheters, we saw that there was no standard pre-procedure checklist that informed consent was only obtained in 25% of the time. This is observing the work, how it was done. Eight different ways fellows had to gown and glove. Eight different ways. Some wore caps, some didn't. Some wore gowns, some didn't. Some washed their hands before they put on the sterile gloves, some didn't. You all sit there and say, oh my God, what a horrible place that Allegheny General Hospital must be. Go and look. Go and look. You can't find this out sitting behind the desk. You must go and observe. Six different ways to drape and prep the area. So we said, please use subclavian catheters, right? Please use the subclavian as the safest place to place the line. Well, people use folded towels, people use frenestrated drapes, people would put drapes there, and if there were no hole, they cut a hole. Eight, six different ways to do it. Why? Why? And if you do it six different ways, tell me what the right way is. Can anyone tell me which way is right? Standardization of work is not meant to usurp prerogative. What it does is it frees the mind to deal with the complexity that is the real illness. So if everyone agrees, for God's sake, this is the way we're gonna put a catheter in, your mind is free to think about the really important things. We had five different insertion kits. We only used one, but we kept five on stock. 
illustrating the ways. And only 55% of the time when we made these observations did uh, we actually document it. Now let me explain to you what I mean. So we watched a pulmonary fellow and a nurse put a pulmonary catheter in a patient in our 26 bed unit. And in the middle of the procedure, you know, there's this little syringe they use to find the vein. Those the house officers in the room, fellows will nod their head. A little syringe goes in, and the fellow took, you know, found the vein, took the syringe off, put the syringe on the patient, which had a, a sterile drink down on it, and the syringe rolled just off the sterile field, just off, just off. Nurse looked at doctor, doctor looked at nurse, doctor grabbed syringe, went back to work. So what is this, like a five second rule at home and it's the floor? <laughs> right? What is this? Afterward, in debriefing about this, we said to the nurse and the doctor, what were you thinking? I said, we didn't know how far off the sterile field it had to go before it wasn't sterile. How long it had to live there before it wasn't sterile. When you do not standardize work, and when people don't know what to expect, the nurse said, I wasn't sure. Five second rule. <laughs> when you don't specify it, you don't allow all the eyes to see the defect. And so it propagates to an error. The other thing that we found was that when we looked at the data, we spend our lives now preoccupied with these checklists for putting the catheters in. 97% of the infections in our unit occurred at least five days after the catheter was in. It had nothing to do with how the catheter was placed, it was how it was being maintained. And when we asked the nurses, how do you do this? They said, we don't know, we're not sure. I mean, sometimes we change the dressing once a week, sometimes we change it three times a week, sometimes we change it if it's damp, sometimes we change it if it's bloody, sometimes we don't change it if it's bloody. No spe First of all, we didn't know who did it. Was it the line team that did it? Was the nurse that did it? Who was supposed to do it? What was the definition of a site at risk? What'd you do when it became red and swollen? Did you have what you needed to do your work? Did we understand what our goals were? And we had no record of where the location was. This was another great example. A nurse's aide in the ICU were rounding on these patients during the early days of the line initiative. And when we rounded on these patients, everyone in the unit joined me at the bedside to talk about this. Everyone, a nurse's aide, a clerk, uh, environmental services person, and I'll give you a great illustration of their input later. Everybody came to see. And we had said that it's the job of the nurse's aide to diagram on a little sheet on the front of the patient's room each day where the lines are. And so the, the resident came in and said, yeah, and this guy's got a left internal jugular catheter. The nurse's aide said, no, he's got a left femoral line too. And I said, the, the intern said, no, 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 left internal jugular. Nurse's aide said, no, I changed the bed this morning. I'm responsible for figuring out where the lines is. And this guy has a left femoral line in that was put in the emergency room that nobody bothered to check. A nurse's aide calling out, clearly understanding in this case, his role every morning when we rounded. And his job to document on this little skeleton we put up there where the lines were. Calling out a defect that could have propagated into an error. The engagement of every worker in a specified role. So when you find a problem, how do you solve it in real time? Let me, let me stop here for a second, because many people say to me, well, Dr. Shannon, how did you find the time to go to this unit every day during the 90 days of this experience? I went to the unit every day. Not, you know, not for four hours, but for at least 60 minutes of engagement with the workforce to help them solve the problems. People said, how did you find an hour a day, seven hours a week? When I agreed to take this project on, I said to my boss, the way I'm gonna free up my time to do this work is I'm gonna stop going to those meaningless meetings where we talk about this and do nothing. <laughs> and I saved myself 10 hours a week by not going to places where all we did was talk about it. How do we define it? Where are we gonna report it? What? free leaders to go to the point of care. If they're not there solving problems with workers, it won't happen. It won't happen. Every day for 90 days, an hour. And people say, when I first go up there, why is he here? What's going on? By the end of it, they could pull to me to help solve their problems. They saw the leader as a laborer, which is what leaders must be in the patient safety effort. So what you find is, here's a problem. This, I'll just give you one example. And here's what 
the group in the unit decided should be the solution. So the first problem was, in the middle of the night, an introducer in a sick patient kinked. So the guy was receiving some kind of presser, and the medicine wasn't going in, so the blood pressure came, you know, fell from 100 to 70 because the catheter wasn't working. Intern looks at the catheter, doesn't feel comfortable messing with it, calls the pulmonary fellow and says, kinked catheter. Pulmonary fellow says, let me tell you what to do. Go in there, pour a little chlorhexidine or betadine over the site, wipe it down good and gently, stick it back through the introducer. About 24 hours later, hypotension, fever, bacteremia, leukocytosis, gram-positive coccyte growing out of the blood from what was clearly a breach in process that occurred the night before. Now, because this bacteremia occurred 24 hours later, we gathered everybody together and said, you know, what, what happened? What happened? Not who done it, right? This wasn't a who's responsible. We're all responsible. What happened? What was the defect in the delivery of care that allowed this to happen? And we all settled on the notion that the problem was the catheter kinked. So the question was, what do we do when catheters kink? We're in an ICU. People are desperately ill. We push the catheter back in. That's your mother. Let's think this through for a second. And so what we said was, guys, if it doesn't work, replace it. And Mr. Pulmonary Fellow, that's your job. That's your job. And if you're up all night doing this, then tomorrow we have to send you home. But you be up all night doing this. That's your job. So what you have to say to the Pulmonary Fellowship Director is if our ICU docs are going to be up all night, you've got to go home the next day. So you'll have to go to clinic without your fellow. Only leaders can do those things, right? The nurse manager isn't going to tell the pulmonary fellowship director to put that guy in the unit at night. But that's what we have up. And there's similar sort of things. But you've got to do it in real time. If you do it a month later, it's gone. So here's some results. I don't want to belabor this, but I want to show you. Here's where we began. 22 infections, 19 people died. A year later, we admitted 45 more patients to the unit. We put in 211 more catheters, and we had one death and um, six infections. So we had gone from 49 to six. My surgical colleagues, Dr. Shannon, I don't, don't want to interrupt you, but six is not zero. <laughs> True, it's not zero, but it's a hell of a lot closer to zero than we were. Secondly, one death, one death. Now people said to me, Dr. Shannon, you can't prove to me those 19 people died of this infection. And I said to them, you're right, I can't prove they died of this infection, but I guarantee you that bacteremia didn't help their leukemia. That unless you were trying to lower their blood pressure through some physiological means, the bacteremia doesn't help. I said, they're better drugs. So yes, it, I can't prove they died. Nobody got better. Nobody got better with the infection. Now, this was very interesting and very increasingly good results. We, initially, we could, all, we could put a catheter in 22 patients before we got an infection. Now we could put 185 in before we got an infection. Significant gains. But the next year, this is a really important lesson for leaders. The next year, we went from six infections to 11. Now, all my critics are saying, told you. Not sustainable, not sustainable. And in fact, this was a concern. When we went back and looked at each of these infections, what we discovered was that nine of the 11 infections occurred in PIC catheters, a new type of catheter that we had put in to help deal with access issues, but that we hadn't standardized the workaround. No one knew what the proper way to maintain those dressings were. No one knew whether or how the bio patch fit on a pick line. No one knew whether you should put that guard on there so it doesn't piston back and forth to create irritation in the skin. And once we did, we went to four. Now we could put 500 catheters in before anybody got infected. Today, well not today, but as of July of 2010, I haven't been in that ICU for four years. 26 beds, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Allegheny General Hospital. They have had one bloodstream infection in 62 months. They can now put a catheter in 14,000 times before they get an infection. That's reliable. They've admitted 160 more, three more people to the ICU, and they've reduced the mortality by 23%. And the nurse's motto in that unit, taking after good old Harry Truman, is not the buck stops here, but the bug stops here. 
There is a culture that will not tolerate an infection. A culture that went from accepting it was okay for 19 people to die to one that says, not on my watch. And where it's everyone's responsibility.